Um, okay, so a quick thank you to everybody streaming in. We'll get started when the clock strikes two here in New Jersey, three in St. Lucia. Um, but thank you to everybody uh, so far for coming to attend this event. Um, we're very much looking forward to an interesting discussion and a joyous celebration. Um, looks like it is two o'clock now. Yep. So I'll just say a, a quick words to begin. Um, thank you to everybody for coming. Princeton Caribbean Connection is very honored and excited to be putting on this event as the first, um, not only of ours in the new year, but of our relaunch. Um, personally, as a St. Lucian, I am very excited to be hosting this event in honor of Sir Arthur Lewis um, as an inspiration from the same island that I am from, uh, going into the same field that I am interested in going into um, and making so many incredible contributions to the field and also being the first black professor at Princeton University, which is amazing, not only as part of the Caribbean community here on campus, but as part of the black community here on campus. And so um, with all of that, we are very, very excited, and very honored to be able to host this event so close to the anniversary of his birthday and right before the beginning of Black History Month. I'd like to say a quick thank you to all of our panelists who are able to join us here. Um, to Professor Tigner of the Prince University History Department and author of Sir Arthur Lewis's autobiography and a close friend of his, um, Dame Perlette Louise, uh, the first female Governor General of St. Lucia, former Dean of Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, um, Cleta Springer, Chair of the Board of Governors for Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, Rowan Stephen, former Principal of St. Mary's College, and a special thank you to uh, Calix George, uh, senior and junior, my grandfather and my uncle, um, for writing the book, St. Mary's College, uh, which honors the achievements of so many amazing Sumerians, as well as to Elizabeth Lewis and Barbara Lewis, the daughters of Sir Arthur Lewis. We are so thankful that you're able to be here today as we celebrate your father. Um, and so without much more ado, um, I would like to start by allowing Professor Tigner to say a few words um, on Sir Arthur Lewis. Um, Thank you very much. Um, a few words, uh, because that's what I have to do, but uh, I'm going to uh, say something about the highlights of his career before he joined the faculty at Princeton University. And uh, I know a lot about his uh, time at Princeton and I know a lot about uh, his time elsewhere. So um, he was born in St. Lucia in 1915 and he was educated locally at uh, St. Mary's College um, which actually produced two Nobel Prize winners. Amazing, <laughs> truly amazing. Um, and uh, after that, he won a fellowship, uh, a West Indian fellowship to go and study at the London School of Economics. And uh, he finished up his BA degree there and um, he very much wanted to go back to the West Indies. The British wouldn't send him. The colonial office had a great deal of racial prejudice against uh, sending anybody back to his, his area of expertise. And so um, he was encouraged by the faculty at uh, LSU to, um, to join the PhD program. And he received his PhD and became the first black faculty member at LSE. Uh, he was the first of a lot of things. He was the first black faculty member at LSE. 
He was the first um, black faculty member at the University of Manchester. He was uh, the one and only uh, person to receive a Nobel Prize for economics. Um, other, uh, the first black individual to receive a Nobel Prize. Um, in other fields, in any other fields besides peace and uh, literature. Um, Derek Walcott also received a, a Nobel Prize in literature. So um, congratulations to St. Mary's College. Uh, they did a terrific job. Uh, he then joined the faculty at uh, LSE and he was there for four or five years. And uh, he applied for positions elsewhere. And uh, he was recommended for a position at the University of Liverpool. Unfortunately, the vice chancellor, um, um, I would uh, hesitate to say this, uh, but uh, he was a racist and uh, he did not uh, uh, endorse uh, the committee's recommendation uh, that uh, Lewis joined the faculty. Liverpool's uh, mistake was um, the um, triumph of the University of Manchester, where he became the Stanley Jevons Professor of Economic Development. And he was there for a number of years. And then he, um, uh, he also uh, advised the Colonial Office on uh, during the Second World War and after the Second World War, uh, which, in which he uh, encountered some difficulties uh, from an um, individual who thought himself to be a, a, a superior economist, Sidney Kane, um, who was a very good economist, but not, not a Nobel Prize winner. And uh, so he um, did that uh, for a period of time. Then he was unfortunately let go because he spoke about the uh, Federation in, um, uh, in Central Africa. And he was critical of the British colonial office and they, they released him. But then he became um, the chief economic advisor to uh, a newly independent uh, Ghanaian state. And uh, he was offered uh, a lifetime contract by Kwame Nkrumah, the president of uh, Ghana. And, and um, he did not want to uh, be beholden to uh, Ghanaian politicians. And therefore, he got a, um, uh, the United Nations to uh, support his salary. And that was a very, very good uh, action on his part because he ran into great difficulties with, uh, with Nkrumah and the politicians who um, asked him to create a first uh, five-year plan the first five-year plan in uh, Ghanaian history, and he did. And um, the politicians piled on all kinds of interesting other projects that they wanted to be incorporated in the, uh, in the plan. And Arthur privately said, the plan is now become just awful. That was the word that he used, awful. And, uh, but he didn't uh, say that publicly. And when he left um, the um, position 
as the chief economic advisor. He did not uh, display his, uh, his differences with uh, the politicians, Kwame Nkrumah uh, and the others. And so um, briefly he was uh, without a really paying job, uh, but then he was invited by the University of the West Indies uh, to become a, um, a professor of economics and the head of the economics department. And all of a sudden there was an opening uh, for the principalship of the University of uh, the West Indies, the University College of the West Indies. And so he became the first black principal that head in other words, of the University of the West Indies. And, uh, and he then, when the West Indies, University of the West Indies became independent, they had been under the aegis of the uh, University of London, he became the first black vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies at Mono in Jamaica. And then 1961, 62, uh, I believe he uh, took a leave of absence from his job at the University of the, as the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. He um, then was desperate to put together a federation of the West Indian British West Indian colonies. Uh, he thought that was the saving grace of the West Indies and uh, he wore himself out completely and utterly. The doctor came to see him and uh, he was very dizzy, uh, had uh, collapsed uh, on a couple of occasions. And the, uh, the doctor said to him, you have to leave this job in order to uh, retain your health. And uh, so he agreed. And uh, that's when he went to Princeton University. And, and he was teaching there as the first full black professor and a chaired uh, member of the uh, economics department. And what was called at the time the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs uh, until he retired in um, 1983, I think. Um, uh, he received the Nobel Prize in 1979. So I, I think my time is up. Uh, and that's, that's, these are the only highlights that I can mention to you. He was a, an energetic uh, spokesperson uh, for uh, black identity and black causes, but he was a pragmatist uh, and not a radical uh, in, uh, involvement in radical affairs. And uh, he wanted to, uh, to find out a formula for um, how newly independent countries uh, could um, achieve their prosperity and independence. And therefore, his most powerful article was uh, the article published in 1952 called Unlimited Supplies uh, sorry, economic development with unlimited supplies. Uh, it uh, probably was the most influential uh, essay uh, at the time uh, in the field of the new field of development economics. Okay, I'm going to end there. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tigner.
Um, I feel that was a very important um, overview of the life of Sir Arthur Lewis for us to hear. Um, I mean, he was a very amazing man. It was very nice to be able to hear about all of his amazing accomplishments. Um, next, I would like to welcome Elizabeth Lewis, the daughter of Sir Arthur Lewis, to come and say a few words about her father. Thank you very much. Yeah. And it's an honor to be here. Um, my father was very pleased to be part of Princeton University and would be very honored by all of this. Uh, he had a great love of for learning and teaching, and which had developed very early because he started wearing glasses when he was a little boy. Uh, and therefore games were not all that much fun. In addition to which he got ill at about age nine or something like that and was tutored at home for a few months. And then when he got back to school, he skipped two grades. Mm -hmm. So even though he grew to be six feet tall, most of his school years, he was actually a little small for his age. For his group cohort. Uh, so he graduated at age 16 and had to wait before being able to go to college. Uh, he got the scholarship and uh, went off to England and we, that was the start of a lot of different things in his life. He was never deterred by obstacles. He would find ways around them without becoming bitter or humble. He was a realist. He looked at what could be done and moved on. Uh, so yes, there were lots of uh, blocks in his life. Uh, Professor Tigner has mentioned several of them very well, thank you. And, uh, but they never got him angry in that sense. He was a person who did not share much in, uh, personally. He was more, most happy uh, reading his history and his economics, talking about the politics and economics. Uh, and I remember vividly that if I wanted to spend time chatting with my dad, I would read The Economist first. Because then we would have something to talk about. Uh, <laughs> he was a great believer in public education. My sister and I went to the local schools uh, in several different countries because as has been mentioned earlier, he worked in several different countries and he took the whole family with him. So I and my sister ended up going to school in uh, Ghana, England, Jamaica, and here in the States. So uh, we had a very diverse, education, bouncing back between the British system and the American system. But we both made it to college, um, are doing quite well, thank you. Uh, the, he spent his time uh, reading it's where I learned to think of reading as a hobby. Uh, I would, from the age of about three, I would sit in on the floor in his study and look at picture books and eventually uh, graduate to actually being able to read the books <laughs> sitting on that floor. Um, and I've always... He never said, I'm working now, go away. 
It was basically, I'm working now, be quiet. Uh, listen to the, he usually played Mozart or some other classical music while working. So listen to the music. Uh, that's a, a habit that uh, I took with me to college and wrote a lot of papers to Beethoven's music. <laughs> Uh, he he and my mother entertained at home rather than um, uh, no matter what stage he was at uh, whether the house was an official building uh, or just the um, just at home he was always having his students and other professors in. He enjoyed spending time uh, at home around the dinner table. So, uh, he's, he was a very private person, but he was, uh, as I say, a pragmatist. And even though he ended up with over 30 awards of one kind or another, um, the, they did not go to his head. Uh, they almost became a joke. There were so many of them, but we were pleased for all of them. And um, particularly when they came from institutions that were close to his heart, like the one from Princeton. So, uh, that's about it. Uh, there isn't an awful lot you can say about a private person. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Lewis, and Mrs. Lewis Shannon. Um, before we move on, um, Alex George Sr., my grandfather, has uh, recorded a few words about St. Mary's College um, and Sir Arthur Lewis and his legacy with regards to St. Lucia and the education there. Um, and so I'd like to play the video. Thank you, oh. moderator. I'd like to play the video for everybody um, before we move on to the discussion segment of the event. Thank you, Thank you. moderator, Ms. Svetlana Johnson, president of Princeton University Caribbean Connection. Dame Paulette Luisi, Governor General Emerita, and Chair of the Nobel Laureate Committee. Sumerian Honorable Sean Edwards, Minister of Education. Professor Robert Tigner, Rosengarten Professor of Modern and Contemporary History of Princeton University, in fact, Emeritus Professor, and also friend and biographer of Sir William Arthur Lewis, Sumerian, Mr. Clitus Springer, Chair of the Board of Governors of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Mr. Rowan Sion, former principal of St. Mary's College. Specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I am pleased that I can present to Princeton University this small, but as I see it, significant donation of copies of my publication entitled St. Mary's College, St. Lucia, West Indies, the Caribbean, Caribbean's Nobel Laureate School, 130 Years of Human Development. It was first <laughs> published by my son, Calvin jo Calix George Jr. in 2019 on the cusp of the college's 100th, 130th anniversary. Today's event finds itself within the locus 
of 107th, the 107th birthday anniversary of Sir William Arthur Lewis, a son of St. Lucia, an alma, alumnus of St. Mary's College, who was the James Madison Professor of Political Economy and later the James MacDonald Professor of Economics and International Affairs at Princeton University, an institution he gave two decades of his life teaching. This devotion to teaching undoubtedly stemmed from his parents, who were both teachers trained at the Michael Institute in Antigua and who had migrated to St. Lucia. The Latin motto of St. Mary's College is simple yet apt for such a great man. Sumum attingitur nutendo. The top or the summit is reached by striving. It must have been a good, it must have made good sense for a country with so many hills and mountains on which people toil the soil daily. Today, William Arthur Lewis is interred upon one of those hills, the Morn, overlooking Castries, where he was born. On that very hill, too, the buildings of what was once a fortress, the college in his honor, finds a home and called the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Indeed, he and his Nobel laureate twin, Sir Derek Alton Walt Walcott, find their rest amongst ground that was centuries before fought over by St. Lucians who fought and died for their freedom. They fought against the reinstatement of slavery and the economic bondage of colonialism. There was indeed, indeed much strife at the summit of this mountain. St. Mary's College was born in 1890 at the height of British imperialism. The college on Miku Street, into which William Arthur Lewis entered on the 30th, sorry, on the 20th of September, 1924, was an elitist colonial grammar school, patterned after an English, pub, the English public schools, such as Eton, Harrow, Winchester, and Chatterhouse. It was not built for the masses. Of the 26 students who entered in his year, only four had government scholarships. The other students were all students of means. He went to a school headed by English headmasters in a society whose first, first language was Creole. In some respects, he was fortunate coming from an Anglophone speaking family. Fortune, however, was not altogether on his side. His father died when he was just eight years old, the year prior to his entry at St. Mary's. He would have known loss. He had to be one of the boys to win one of the three government scholarships that were available to St. Mary's. The only other available scholarships were provided by the Castries Vestry. And since he belonged to the Church of England, he was not eligible. Some correctly describe the century that preceded emancipation in the West Indies between 18, the 1830s and the 1930s as a period of stagnation. Then too, there were periods of regression quite often brought on by disasters such as the Castries Fire of 1927. His parents, however, 
who took to the philosophies of Marcus the Marcus Garvey movement, instilled in Lewis a strong desire to break the stranglehold of imperialism. As he put it in his biography, my interest in development was a product of my anti-imperialism. He always saw a new opportunity for growth and learning. At the age of 14, he had already comp completed studies at St. Mary's College. In fact, he had done his uh, junior and senior Cambridge certificates uh, and got distinctions in Latin. There was only one way out for boys like himself, which was the Island Scholarship. This scholarship was originally instituted by an English headmaster called J.D. Fisher in 1918 and was afforded just one scholarship a year. Lewis was too young to write the exam and had to temper his brilliance for about three years. During that time, he worked at the Department of Agriculture, which was located at the Curator's Lodge in what is known as the Botanic Gardens, in a wooden building which still stands today. I am of the view that it was at the Department of Agriculture that he first came into direct contact with members of the plantocracy, as well as the numerous subsistent farmers of the then expanding peasantry. This perhaps, consciously or unconsciously, led him later in life to write on certain aspects of agricultural development and also to conceptualize the dual economy, economy phenomenon which so shaped his future with his seminal economic development with unlimited supplies of labor and which eventually led to the award of the Nobel Prize. In 1932, Lewis won the scholarship and went to study, some, into, went to study what no St. Lucia knew what, anything about, which was economics. He says that in going through, as he put it in his, word, in his own words, as I leaf through the University of London prospectus, my eye caught, was caught by something called the Bachelor of Commerce degree, which offered accounting, statistics, business law, business management, economics, a foreign language, and economic history. What was this economics? I had never heard of it before, and nobody in St. Lucia knew what it was all about. That clearly didn't stop him from reaching the top. That subtle confidence instilled in him by his mother that said to him, that he was as good as anyone else in the world, that all he had to do was strive, certainly changed the world and gave rise to development economics. His conceptualization of development economics based on equality also inspired many of his time to see Africa as a potential place of hope and opportunity. His classmate, Luther Patterson, who won the 1934 scholarship, went off to Ghana, where he became an advisor to Quen Kwame Nkrumah. Incidentally, before he was advisor, he uh, taught at a school similar to one of St. Mary's College, which was called Achimoto College. Lewis, too, 
was also in the black back to Africa movement as evidenced by his preparation of the first economic development plan for independent Ghana. The thrust towards Africa was first led by Caribbean greats like George Padmore and uh, James and CLR James, who incidentally were also associated with um, uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, uh, on the the, the um, Pan African uh, Pan African um, uh, Association in London. The Caribbean has always been part of the development conversation, and that we can continue to con and that we shall continue to contribute to global thought and direction. Lewis did not just read economics, he redefined it, particularly in respect of developing countries. I hope that this small gesture can spark a renewed affiliation between the Caribbean and Princeton. When Sir Arthur Lewis won the Nobel Prize, he was the second person from Princeton to have done so in the field of economics. Today, there are nearly 80 Nobel laureates who have been associated with Princeton. And last year, an unprecedented five laureates were connected with this renowned university. Likewise, St. Mary's College is one of less than 50 secondary schools in the world that can boast of having two or more alumni as Nobel laureates. In fact, we can boast that St. Mary's has the greatest number of laureates per country population. Two, the highest number of laureates per school population. Three, the highest number of laureates per square mile. And fourthly, the highest number of laureates per capita in the world. The story of St. Mary's College has certainly been elevated by these two men who always believed that they could break down barriers and strive to the summit. I am pleased that St. Lucia and the Caribbean and the Caribbean's stories of excellence can be shared with Princeton University today. In closing, may I spare, say a special thank you to my granddaughter Svetlana, who was born in St. Lucia and is now reading for her first degree in economics at Princeton for making this event possible. I sincerely hope a new intellectual triangle can be realized with St. Mary's College, the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, and Princeton University in memory of William Arthur Lewis. I am of the view that such a triandic relationship would be of tremendous benefit to all parties. I thank you and Happy Enlightened Reading. Thank you to my grandfather, Calix George Sr., um, for giving us this video to explain more about um, the legacy of St. Mary's College and new avenues for educational attainment in St. Lucia and in the Caribbean. Um, before we continue into the panel discussion, I would like to give some space for Honorable Sean Edward, uh, Minister of Education at St. Lucia, to say a few words. Thank you very much. And I bring greetings to everybody from St. Lucia. I know some of you are in North America and other parts of the world where you are at the mercy of the atmospheric conditions. 
Um, let me just take the opportunity to thank the organizers of this very auspicious event for inviting me to be on in my capacity as the Minister for Education. Um, I must say that today's activity has a lot of significance, not just for the Ministry of Education, but for St. Lucia as a country. Sir Arthur Lewis Community, Co Community College, named in the honor of Sir Arthur himself, is the flagship educational institution in our country, where we send our children to get an education that would cause them to make significant contributions to development in our country. And although many of our, our children are not able to relate to the work of Sir Arthur as we would like, the one thing I always attempt to do when I engage young people is to show them the power in the example of Sir Arthur Lewis himself. Sir Arthur Lewis is a reminder, an everyday reminder, not just for young people, but for every St. Lucian, that it does not matter your circumstances in life. If you have a plan and you are driven, nothing in this world is insurmountable. In other words, you can achieve anything you set out to achieve. And when we, we, we walk through and we drive through the various communities in St. Lucia today, many of our students are living lives that Zafa Lewis, that a life similar to what he had as a child growing up. He was not privileged from what we've been told. He had to work hard. And in spite of all the obstacles that he had in his path, he was able to attain the highest possible achievements in his chosen field. So the example for young people, the example for our country is not restricted only to the realm of academics, but it speaks more to the willpower of the average St. Lucian. And for me, every day, it's not the economic theory that was postulated, but just the measure of the man in terms of how he was able to overcome adversity how he was able to put up against racism, how his personal circumstances in life did not impede what he set out to achieve for himself. And ultimately for us as a country is the reminder that smallness of size should never be an obstacle um, on, on, in, your, in your quest to attain greatness. Sometimes we speak of St. Lucia in comparison to other countries of the world. And we just a dot, we just a dot on, 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 on the world map. But we should never, ever be measured by the geographic um, dot that you see on a map. The geographic landmass of St. Lucia is not what really defines us. But Sir Arthur Lewis was the example that went into every nook and cranny of this world Reminding not just solutions, but persons from smaller societies that they can set out to achieve anything that they put their mind to. And that is the example that I want the young children in our school system to emulate the Sir Arthur Lewis example. And if Sir Arthur could have come out of St. Lucia and could have overcome all the obstacles and the barriers that were put in his path, and he was still able to overcome those to become the great statesman that he was, not just for St. Lucia and the Caribbean, but the world, I believe our children have an example that is very close to home that they can emulate in their quest for greatness, irrespective of their chosen field. So once again, I'm very, very pleased to have been invited to be part of this auspicious activity for the commemoration of Sir Arthur Lewis. And as I said, I'm just hoping that his legacy will continue to live on and be an example for all the citizenry in St. Lucia. Thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to a very engaging afternoon um, on the different issues that will be discussed here today. Thank you so much, Honorable Sean Edwards. Um, that was a very impassioned speech. And I think that it speaks to a lot of what is um, really impressive about Sir Arthur Lewis and about Lucian education and Caribbean education in general and the ways that it can take people from very small beginnings and elevate them um, and give them power to, to forge new paths. And so I would like to continue on into the panel discussion about Caribbean education, Lucian education um, 
at large. And so as a quick reminder to our audience, um, we have many amazing panelists here. Dame Perlette Luizzi, um, the first female governor general of St. Lucia and the former dean of Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Um, Rowan Sion, former principal of St. Mary's College. Uh, Cletus Springer, the chair of the Board of Governors for Sir Arthur Lewis um, Community College. Um, and so without much ado, I would like to open the floor up for a panel discussion um, and remind the audience that please feel free to ask questions and use the Q&A function, not the chat function, to do so. Um, so I think that I'm going to start off and ask a question. And um, just because we've heard so much about uh, the power of education on Sir Arthur Lewis's life, I'd like to ask our panelists, what do you think is unique about education in St. Lucia? Um, and feel free to unmute yourselves to respond. Um, Mr. Sion, I see that you're speaking, but unfortunately you're muted. Can you unmute yourself, please? Yes. Can you? Yes. Is that, is that... Right. Yeah. Unique about education, I think the obvious thing we'd start by saying is that we are bilingual, for one thing. We have an, the advantage from one perspective and another from other people's point, point of view, a disadvantage, they may think of having a society where the language of education is not necessarily the language that's used in everyday communication by a very large percentage of our people. So we find ourselves having to deal with this language issue where in the rural parts of St. Lucia, there are many people who may not have mastered the major language as well as might have been. So there's always this, this challenge. Um, I must say of late, it's, it has been turned into an, an advantage, but perhaps not as rapidly as it could have been done. There have been moves of it to, to utilize the Creole language as part of the educational process, but that has gone very, very slowly. But I think if we have to highlight one aspect about St. Lucian education that's unique, it would be related to the bilingual nature of our society. Unique in a Caribbean context, I should say, because that's not necessarily anything around the world, but certainly the islands around us, um, Barbados, even Martinique, which is French, Barbados, which is 100% English, we have this distinction of the bilingual situation. Thank you. Uh Yes, thank you. Um, Dame Perlet, would you like to say anything? I'm sorry. Um, it seems that you're muted as well. Would you please? <laughs> oh, yes. I, I, was, I was not muted and I thought I was. I'm having a problem. I'm having a problem with with feedback and, and I'm not sure where it's coming from. Um, I hear it as well. Um, it, it seems like you have two devices on. If you can turn off one of the devices, it might uh, limit uh, the hmm. I, don't know. I don't know. Ah. In the meantime... Uh, yes, so, uh, okay, there you are. Oh, okay. I um, told me my bandwidth was low, there, so I had a problem there. Yes, um, I, I, I was very, um, and I'm interested in what um, Mr. Sion just spoke about because, um, you know, as a lot of people know, my, my, my interest in, in, um, in, in Creole and in the promotion of, of Creole, particularly in our education system. And um, I, I do recall um, Professor Simmons McDonald's um, uh, research um, into the educational outcomes of, of students in St. Lucia, on the, which, which tend to show that, that that problem with going into school and 
being expected to perform in a language which is not their own, which is not their first language, which they don't even speak at home, has, you know, has um, poses a lot of problems for them. And perhaps if St. Lucia embraced the, um, the concept of bilingual education, that would, that would you know, foster a more you know, openness to language, to language development and to academic um, performance. So I am glad that, that Mr. Sion brought, brought that up. I don't know that uh, as far as uniqueness in other ways, um, I think we, we, we have not done too, too, too badly in the, in the sense that we have been able um, you know, to, to provide, even in our small, with our small population, an institution of, 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 of learning at the tertiary level, which on the South Louis Community College, which, um, which is probably you know, comparable to quite a few community colleges, not only in the region, but, but in other small developing countries. So I think in, in our case, really, it's probably a question of, of, of um, our resources. Um, and if we could get beyond that, I think we would be able, we, we could stand our own anywhere in the world as far as education is concerned. Mm -hmm. So we have a good quality education. And I say that because, you know, I, I, I've studied, you know, I mean, in St. Lucia, in the, in the Caribbean, in Canada and in Bristol, and I didn't find our, myself or even my students, they didn't seem to have been at much, at a disadvantage when they found themselves, you know, um, among, um, you know, students from all over the world and they've performed, you know, admirably. I, I remember saying to some of my students who would write and say, Miss, I made it on the Dean's list. And I said, what, you know, I said, what kind of students do you have out there? And they would laugh, which only shows that the foundation which, which, which St. Lucia gave them. And we can see that with the two, the, our two laureates and with uh, Louis, whom we are celebrating and commemorating today. Thank you. Um, Mr. Edward, I see that your hand is raised. Would you like to say a few words on the topic? Absolutely. And I do not want to speak out of turn because Mr. Sion would have been my principal at the St. Mary's College. So I want to make sure that whatever I say this afternoon is a true reflection of what he would have taught me. Um, on, on the subject of language, um, as mentioned by Mr. Sion, I think this is a very important point. And I think um, Dim Willett also mentioned it. I think, I think a case is being made now for the inclusion of the French West Indian Creole, which we call Patois, into mainstream education as far as lesson delivery is concerned. Um, this, this has not happened, but as we speak, there's a language policy paper that is in draft form. And, and the intention is for the formal education system to begin to embrace Creole in instruction delivery. It may not, and, and the intention is not for it to replace English as the official language and the preferred language for instruction. But Mr. Sion made a very important point. We have a vast majority of St. Lucians, particularly in the rural parts, for whom Creole is still a first language. This is the first language for them. And at every step in society, in every facet, Creole has been pushed aside. And we, we saw um, in the mid 1990s, a case was made for Creole um, to be spoken in the parliament, parliament of Zenosha. And I think that was a very important first step, but I still believe that we have some distance to travel for there to be a full incorporation of French West Indian Creole um, in the lexicon of, of St. Lucia. In terms of, of, of the education that we, we, we present to the world and we present to our students, the question has been asked, what really is education? And, and Dimpolet just moments ago mentioned how her students meet her and, and both she and her students, they beam with confidence and pride when it is announced that they have made the Dean's List at some of the most prestigious schools in the world. And that is commendable. 
and the example of Sir Arthur himself and Derek Walcott, and there's so many outstanding solutions in the field of academia who continue to, to, to cause our country as a collective to punch above its weight. I mean, that is commendable. There is no question that, that we are comparable to people from any other country um, in the world. But the question has to be asked, is education merely having content in, in lesson delivery? That is, that is at the same level as what obtains in more developed countries? Or should it be a combination where the, the content is aligned? Our students can take international exams and, and outperform some of their counterparts in the metropolitan countries that, that is established. But to what extent do we appeal to the core of our students? To what extent does the education that we postulate and we teach and we serve, to what extent does it appeal to the core values of our young people? Every day we turn on the television set to watch the evening news. We see the number of young people who are involved in criminal acts. And, and we're asking ourselves, some of these very students, they would make the dean's list, they would top the, the exams at the school level, and they would rank amongst the best in the country. But when you do a little more um, um, research in terms of their background, you notice there are some of the same young people who are engaged in some of the most unsavory acts in society. So for me, the education has to be more than just attaining impressive results and being able to command places at the most prestigious institutions. But we want that at the end of, of that educational journey from, from, the, from kindergarten right through to university level, that as our, our citizens, they, they acquire skills and knowledge commensurate with, with that would be the values that are needed to make them coexist peacefully and, um, and, and progressively with their fellow men in St. Lucian society and wherever else in the world they may choose to reside. I just think I needed to make that point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Springer, I see that you have your hand raised as well. Um, in addition, I wanna uh, give some time to the questions that we see coming in from our attendees. Um, so if you wouldn't mind also answering, I think it sort of fits into the question that we were talking about before. How do you think the standard of education in St. Lucia has changed from the early part of the 1900s when Sir Arthur was educated to now in the 2000s, and if so, how? Um, Mr. Springer? Yes, thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everybody. I think I recognize the presence of the Honorable Prime Minister among our participants, so I want to uh, say a special good afternoon to him and to thank him for joining us. I, the, the confluence in the questions and in the question in the chat and the comment I was about to give um, is pretty stark um, because I, I think there's a, there's a temporal nature to the education that existed at the time of Sir Arthur and the, and the education that exists, that exists now. I remember doing a, a documentary on, on um, Sir Alan Lewis, um, so, so Arthur's brother, and there was a, a point in that um, he, he did his law degree by correspondence uh, course, um, himself and Vernon Cooper and, and several other luminaries um, in St. Lucia. And I, I make that point to, to indicate that, apropos the point that Minister Edwards was making, that when you have adversity or when you have challenge, you rise over it. And, and so you have people like Sir Alan who did not have access to university education, but got his degree via, via uh, correspondence, which was, the, which, which was the norm in those days because access to further education was not, did not exist. And then you have Sir Arthur now who uh, uh, was brilliant enough to get an island scholarship, which was, which was a rarity in those days. Um, and in the post Sir Arthur Lewis period, in the days of the, when we were part of the, the colonial system, as well as in the days of, of our independence, both, both pre and post independence, we had access to a whole range of opportunities to go to study overseas um, for a whole range of, of sponsors, uh, the Canadians, the British, you know, we had scholarships um, that we could, we could uh, pursue. Another interesting distinction between the two periods was that, and that boggles my mind all the time, the quality of, it, of teaching in those days seemed to me to have been of a, a much higher quality, although our teachers at the time did not have formal teaching qualifications. 
Um, and so it's you, you speak of the foundation that so often was received. That foundation came by and large from teachers who were not formally qualified. Um, so to come to Sir Arthur, I see Sir Arthur Lewis Community College as helping to bridge that divide of opportunity and to make tertiary education available to every solution who does not have access to uh, 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 scholarships, internationally provided scholarships and so on. And, and that is where I believe the government um, has already pledged that it will um, beef up the South Lewis Community College, increase its investment in, in South Africa, because I think across the board, investment in higher education in the Eastern Caribbean lags significantly behind investment in the bigger uh, Caribbean countries. Jamaica, for example, um, uh, its investment in higher education is almost four or five times that of St. Lucia. And so we need to do a, a, a lot of work to increase access to education by our uh, solution. Thank you, Springer, for that answer. Um, it does seem that we have run to the end of our time limit. I do want to um, give up one more question for the panel um, that I think is relevant both to our discussion and to what we're celebrating. Um, so from Cornelius Renee, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Considering that educational opportunity is more widely available in St. Lucia now than it was when Sir Arthur Lewis and Sir Derek Walcott school were schooled, does the panel believe that St. Lucia can produce another Nobel laureate? Um, Hi. Um, if I may be allowed. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yes, Mr. Sion. Yeah, right. Yes, that's okay, strange enough. That's a question that we, we once had a major discussion on at St. Mary's College. Um, I just want to I just want to make one point before I specifically answer it. I just want to perhaps I can use this opportunity to con congratulate Mr. Sean Edwards on uh, his now the position of being Minister of Education in St. Lucia. I, I, he was quite quite correct. I did teach him at St. Mary's. And he's one young man who demonstrated the very qualities that we're talking about. Sean didn't come from any particularly well-off background. He, 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 he climbed a difficult ladder and is now the Minister of Education. And he himself, I think, is a good example for what is possible. He, he used sport. He was an outstanding cricketer. And that is how he actually made an impact at the school at St. Mary's College. And through the sports and, of course, his, his academics as well, I think is able to establish the confidence and presentation that you're hearing from him right now, because he didn't come into school like that. That is something that grew as he went through the years of the school, largely because of his involvement in sports. And this is one area that I think is not being utilized fully. The confidence of our young people has to be boosted in whatever way that they have natural talent. Um, he mentioned the fact that we have people who are engaging in, in unsavory activity, although they may be doing well at school. And that is a fact, it is a fact. It is an unfortunate fact. And I think the solution there is to find out what these people really want to do for themselves as well. A lot of them are talented in areas that may not necessarily be purely academic. And I think if the minister recognizes that in his own situation, he had this talent in, in, in sports, that enable him to blossom as a young man and therefore develop academically out of the foundation of sports. So that, that is one area that we should not underestimate. And I'm, I was very pleased when I uh, understood he has been made Minister of Education because I think his own life is an excellent example of what can happen to many young people in St. Lucia if they're given the correct guidance. And St. Mary's College has to take a little credit for that. And I think Mr. Calix George will be pleased about that. Now, going back to the, to the question about the matter of the, um, whether we're going to get another Nobel Prize winner. Well, <laughs> that's an interesting one. We already broke so many records in having two out of such a small school, but nothing is impossible. There's so many brilliant young men in the area. I, the young men now who are at, at MIT were doing Excellent work there. There was talk about, I think, Dr. Winston Paris is doing some important work in, in, in pain management. 
and so on. He has, he has been cited in, in some time ago as one potential candidate. I don't want to be calling too many names, of course, but I think it's always possible. We just have to keep doing what we do well. And what, what we do well is, is developing young men, sending them out in the world, and excelling wherever we go. It's, it's perhaps a little more competitive now because you have a different focus with the high, perhaps competitive nature of, 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 of the educational situation. But I think it's quite possible. And I look forward to some young man from Samaris College, again, in the not too distant future, being included at least in the shortlist of possible Nobel Prize winners. Yeah, could I could I just say something there, Mr. Sion? I know sure, you're sure. of, of of Nobel laureates as young men and uh, men and oh and, there. Well oh, yeah. Oh Danny, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that, but you know why I would <laughs> oh, For those who don't know, Samaris College is 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 an institution exclusively <laughs> focuses on young men. <laughs> and and the employment itself comes from the other institution focuses on young ladies, so she will be concerned. And then I suspect I, I know what she's going to do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, that's a short... Um, I think this is why... One of the reasons why we celebrate um, Nobel Laureate uh, Festival every year, it's, I mean, first of all, yes, it's to honor our, um, our laureates, their, their life work, their achievements. But also I've always made it a point that is, it gives us an opportunity to, to nurture, challenge, and get persons to look deep down within themselves and excel in whatever field of endeavor. So that is why our theme has always been celebrating excellence. And it may not necessarily be just Nobel laureates, but if you, 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 you try to be excellent in every field of endeavor, there is, there is perhaps no reason. I said there's no quota on the number of Nobel laureates per country. So, but, but, but what we need to do is to, to understand that we need to celebrate ourselves, celebrate our achievements, great or small. And then incrementally, we could build on that. And who knows? Yes, there is the possibility that the St. Lucia could become a Nobel laureate. And uh, I think that the field has been broadened a bit in the Caribbean because there's now the, the Caribbean, um, the, the laureates. Yes, that's correct. In, yes. Out of Trinidad, the, the, right. the and, and some Macau, um initiative where right. you have people you know who have excelled in, in different fields and maybe if the, the Nobel um, committee expands the areas in which you know they, they can award the Nobel Prize you you know I think it, it's been it's a bit restricted and it has been so for such a long time I'm sure the time has come when you know for the the, the Nobel committee um, to look at at, at broadening the, the areas of, 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 of specialization um, that people can um, aspire to as far as the Nobel laureate uh, prize, yeah. Nobel prize is concerned. Yes, that's what I thought I had to say on behalf of the Nobel laureate festival committee, celebrating excellence. Very good. I, I thought you would have highlighted St. Joseph Convent's possibility of, of, <laughs> well, no. of a Nobel Prize as well. <laughs> well, not necessarily St. Joseph's Convent, um, but, um, but ladies. Yes, ladies. Of course, of course, a lady. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, yeah, I totally agree with that. <laughs> yes, I'm I, I happy to leave you, you know. Can I, make a, <laughs> can I make a quick point? Uh, yes, Mr. Springer. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to say that um, one of the areas that I believe is central to expanding the, the range of, of opportunity for our, our students and for our people generally is for us to create a more inquisitive um, a student or citizen. I, I think the, the power of inquiry is, is critical for us to advance in education or in any other sphere of life. And, and connected to that, I think there's a role for research. 
uh, applied research, which Sir Arthur did, did a lot of that, um, which led to his groundbreaking uh, um, study. Um, but I, I, I do believe that that is a weakness in our education system where we are perhaps not producing as many inquisitive thinking people as, as we probably need to. Um, I remember as a boy, when we, when we played, uh, played around, we, we, we always looked for different ways of doing things, different ways of building a truck, different ways of building a kite. Um, and I, I see that element um, oozing out of our, of our economic, of our education system. And I believe we need as a country to get some more thought into how we can produce a more inquisitive minded citizen. Yeah, and, and you know, Peter, that's a, a vital point because right now the dominant type of activity which young people engage in tends to be the ready-made technological equipment, the, 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 the games, the video games and so on. There's much less of the outdoor individual type activities where you, you talk about making a kite and making them. That was more creative, more innovative in its own right. Now we import our games and the games are created for us by other people. So there's this restriction in the, in the lateral thinking concerning even the very games that we engage in as Sharon. And they start off from three years old playing at video games, which suppresses the possibility of the individual creative thinking that could have come out of the making your own type of, of, of toy, the, the, the kites and the, and the trucks and so on. So you're, you're making an excellent point there. That's where we have to consciously introduce that aspect into the curriculum where people can, the youngsters can be given a chance to explore their own thoughts and see what capabilities they have in terms of creativity. I totally agree with that. Thank you, Mr. Sian and Mr. Springer. Um, and I think with that um, thought on, on increasing the inquisitive nature of uh, St. Lucian students, um, I do think that that's a very interesting point and something that we can maybe continue in a different discussion because unfortunately we have um, gone over time. Um, in the future, I hope that maybe we can continue this discussion with a little bit more time allotted to um, so many amazing panelists. Um, I see that our audience members were very engaged and so I want to thank our audience members again for coming. Um, and give a quick thank you to all of our panelists. I just want to be really cognizant of time because I know that many people have other engagements. Um, so I'd like to say thank you again to all of our amazing panelists for coming and joining us in this discussion and this celebration um, and for engaging in such a thoughtful and interesting uh, conversation about the state of education in St. Lucia, both in St. Mary's College and in St. Joseph's Convent. Um, I would also like to give a thank you to the Prince University African American Studies Department for co-sponsoring this event, to uh, my fellow board members on Caribbean Connection. Um, and uh, I'd like to give a personal thank you um, to my grandmother and my, to both of my grandmothers um, who were both educators in the Caribbean. Um, and who in their own way have contributed to Caribbean education and to the knowledge that I have of Caribbean education. Um, and so thank you again to everybody for joining us here today. I hope that everyone um, had a good time. Um, and I would once again like to say that I would appreciate to continue this conversation um, some other time. Um, but if our panelists have any um, final words that they'd like to say before we leave. I am open to that because I know that we are in the middle of a very spirited discussion. Uh, just a quick word to say to follow up on the point that um, that uh, Calix George Senior made about the triangular, um, the 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 possible emergence of a triangular relationship between Princeton, Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, and St Mary's College. Uh, this is something that um, the, the Board of Governors of the Arthur Lewis Community College is very eager to uh, pursue. And so we're looking forward to future opportunities for us to advance on that, on that uh, course. Thank you. Oh, um, on that note about um, the contributions of Calix George Sr., um, I'd like to say again that uh, thank him for donating 
uh, the books, St. Mary's College to Princeton University. I know that would be a very important contribution to our discussions on the impact of the Caribbean here at Princeton University. Um, and even though I cannot give these in person right now due to all the restrictions, um, I do think that is a very important contribution and they, these books will be given out um, soon. So thank you again to everybody for joining us. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed this discussion. And like I said, I really look forward to continuing this some other time. Uh, thank you and have a nice day. Goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.